Resuming debate, uh, reprise de débat, the Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I've said this before in other speeches, and others have said it during debate on this bill, but it bears repeating. Canada was built on trade. In fact, one in five jobs in Canada today depend directly on exports. Trade between the colonies of Canada, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia provided the impetus for Confederation, and debates among the Fathers of Confederation demonstrate that an internal free, zone, free trade zone in British North America rivaled mutual defence as their top priority. Canada's history as a trading nation doesn't stop within our own borders. Following divisive debates about free trade over a century ago, recent decades have seen a concerted push to broaden our horizons and establish free trade agreements with other countries. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, Canada, the United States and later Mexico formed a lucrative free trade zone which tripled trilateral trade, tripled investment in Canada by Mexican and American companies and contributed more than 4.5 million Canadian jobs over the years. The debate over free trade has at times been fierce and trade has been a significant ballot question over many federal elections. The 1911 election was a virtual single issue election over reciprocity with the United States. More recently, but still some time ago, we will recall, many will recall, the bitter election campaign over free trade with the United States in 1988. Brian Mulroney was the Prime Minister of the day, and he had successfully negotiated a monumental free trade agreement with the United States. During that campaign, outrageous claims were made by opponents of free trade. They argued that Canada's social safety net would not survive free trade with the United States. They claimed that public health care would disappear. They claimed that trade threatened Canada's culture and that even our sovereignty was at stake. All complete nonsense. I was a 17-year-old high school student during that election, and even then I could see through the rhetoric and recognize the fear-mongering for what it was. And although I was not old enough to vote in that election, I was old enough to take a stand and choose a side in a debate that would profoundly affect the future of my country. And I took my first concrete step into political activism. I joined the Conservative Party. I couldn't understand those who thought it was in the interest of a trade-dependent country like Canada to make imported goods more expensive and to make our exports less competitive. Instead, I knew that the free trade debate was about freedom. Under the visionary leadership of Brian Mulroney, the original free trade agreement was expanded to include Mexico and became the agreement we now know as NAFTA. Opposition to free trade began to wane Eventually, the Chrétien government grasped what was at stake and ratified NAFTA, and successive governments launched a flurry of free trade negotiations with many other countries. Ultimately, the previous government concluded an agreement with the European Union, representing 28 member states, uh, which we are discussing today, as well as concluding negotiations on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, <laughs> representing 12 countries. So now it falls to the current government to carry on where the previous government left off, to conclude the agreements it started, to bring into force the ones it concluded, and to launch new ones, to continue growing Canada's economy through access to markets for our goods and services. I'm pleased that Liberals and Conservatives can debate how to achieve free trade rather than whether there ought to be free trade. We have before us today a bill to ratify. Canada, European Union, Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, commonly called CETA. The history of this agreement highlights one of the best points of Canada's political order and electoral system, the possibility of smooth transitions between governing parties without interruption to important national projects which are clearly in Canada's best interests. The process began with Canadian and European counterparts looking into the merits of a closer trade union in 2007. By August 2014, trade officials succeeded in working out the full text of an agreement, a fact which the previous government rightly celebrated as an important <coughs> milestone. However, the treaty still needed to go through extensive legal review for compatibility with numerous different legal systems and to be translated into many languages. By October 2016, it was ready to sign. And as my colleague, the member for Battleford's Lloyd Minster, pointed out, this was a very difficult process, translating and, and getting uh, this agreement 
into a, a form compatible with and uh, understood in all of the languages and legal systems of the European Union. So as of today, the vast majority of the agreement is ready to implement, and the few outstanding issues that remain can be ironed out uh, and, and implemented in short order. So Madam Speaker, colleagues on both sides of the House have spoken already about the merits of CETA, uh, the merits which CETA will bring to Canada, such as the prospect of creating 80,000 new jobs, adding $12 billion to our GDP, and boosting bilateral trade by 20%. I will not belabor these points further, since they've already been received much attention by those better versed in the details. Instead, I'd like to address concerns that have been raised. Although many of these concerns are the same tired, old, unfounded, knee-jerk cliches that have circulated in some circles since the FTA with the United States was negotiated 30 years ago. Opponents of free trade claim, for example, that trade agreements allow business elites to engage in a race to the bottom in terms of workers' wages, labor standards, and environmental regulation. Although I do not accept that premise, I will point out the following to those that do. The European Union represents Canada's peer countries. The, U the European Union is not bursting with sweatshops with barely paid workers. It has strong labor laws and comparable costs and standards of living. The European Union does not play dirty through currency manipulation. It can be expected to bargain honestly and in good faith. And the, Euro the European Union enforces human rights and environmental standards comparable to our own. In short, CETA is a good deal with a good trading partner which will produce good outcomes for Canadians and Europeans alike. To those who rightly value Canadian sovereignty and examine all agreements for possible infringements, uh, allow me to point out that CETA does not interfere with Canada's right to regulate our own affairs, such as on the economy and environment. The agreement does not touch public services like education and health care, which will remain under exclusive Canadian control. Additionally, the agreement does not interfere with financial measures like debt restructuring. Now, Madam Speaker, as a brief aside, I should mention, at the rate that this government is piling on debt and threatening social, uh, structural deficits, not seen in this country since the times of Trudeau Sr., that latter point about, uh, about financial measures may be more important than one would hope. Uh, but moving from a discussion of concerns about CETA back to one of the benefits it will bring to Canada, I believe that ratification of this bill comes at a critical moment in Canada's relations with our largest trading partner, the United States. As I had mentioned earlier, NAFTA has spurred much economic growth and generated much prosperity in Canada over the last few decades. However, the incoming, the incoming American president has expressed concerns with NAFTA and may want to renegotiate parts of it. Well, since over 70% of Canada's exports currently go to the United States, the current government must make maintaining or increasing the benefits of NAFTA a top priority in the coming years. However, it must also continue the previous government's drive to diversify Canada's export markets through new agreements like CETA and also the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I hope the Prime Minister will not make any more blunders like the one he has already made by making an unsolicited offer to renegotiate NAFTA. As a trained boxer, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister ought to know better than to lead with his chin. Other steps which the government must take to fulfill facilitate trade include approving construction of oil and gas pipelines to get our exports to market and building transportation infrastructure into the north to make it more accessible. There is also much to be done on internal free trade. I was disappointed when the government voted down my colleague's motion to free the beer and seek legal clarity from the Supreme Court as to the constitutional limits on implements to internal trade, but that will be for another day. To conclude, Madam Speaker, the Canada-EU Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement is a good deal for Canada. I look forward to jobs created for my constituents by gaining access to new markets, and I also look forward to better choice for consumers in my riding as well. I pay tribute to Canada's expert professional negotiators and their years of hard work. I acknowledge the tireless efforts of the members from Abbotsford and Battleford's Lloyd Minster when they were in government and the visionary leadership of former Prime Minister Stephen Harper. I also thank the current Minister of International Trade and the current Prime Minister for their willingness to finish the job 
and for their acknowledgement of the role members from both parties have played in getting us to where we are today. After years of rising expectations, a bill to implement this historic agreement is finally before this House, and I, for one, plan to vote for it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires? The Honourable Member for Essex. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I listened intently to my colleague's speech today in the House around this historic deal. And I agree that trade with Europe is too important to get wrong. There have been many things that have changed throughout this agreement, Madam Speaker. Uh, things that have happened in this very year that we are currently in that have changed the context of this agreement. And one of those things is the Brexit. 42% uh, of Canadian exports to the EU are to the UK, and Canadian concessions in CETA were based on the premise that the UK would be part of CETA. After Brexit, the Liberal government has failed to reevaluate the net benefit of a CETA without the UK. So if the UK triggers its exit from the EU and also leaves CETA, is the member comfortable with the concessions Canada has made in CETA, given that the UK represents nearly half of Canada's export market to the EU? The R member for Calgary Rocky Ridge. Well, I thank the, the member for her question, and um, it, it almost kind of sounds like a, a little bit of, of uh, a sign of some hesitant support from, from members of that party that they might actually be on board with a trade agreement, which is uh, refreshing. Uh, but uh, the, the, to go into the question about the rise of, about the, the fact of the Brexit vote and the effect on this agreement, uh, I don't see any reason to take our foot off the gas in getting this agreement approved. I see every incentive and, and every reason why the, uh, the government must engage with the United Kingdom, no matter what it does, uh, so that we may not also lose an opportunity for, uh, for free trade uh, with the United Kingdom, whether it leaves the European Union or not. Um, I, I don't. I, I, I think that it's unfortunate um, that this has happened in the midst of the, the CETA process, but uh, I don't see any reason for um, for the government not to continue to, to press forward and approve CETA and be engaged with the United Kingdom so that we don't lose opportunities uh, in the event that they leave the European Union. Questions and comments. Questions et commentaires. The honourable member, l'honorable député de. Uh, Merci, uh, Madame la Présidente. Et quand j'entends mon collègue parler de l'importance de favoriser le libre-échange avec des partenaires comme l'Europe qui ont des lois semblables quand on regarde les droits de la personne, les droits des travailleurs plus spécifiquement, ou la réglementation environnementale, j'aimerais peut-être attirer son attention sur la question de la réglementation environnementale si on regarde les dispositions investisseurs-État. Si on regarde un exemple au, précis au Québec euh, de l'utilisation du chapitre 11 de l'ALENA, on voit qu'il y a eu un moment en 2011 où le Québec a interdit un permis euh, de fracturation de, pour une compagnie, Lone Pines, qui est située à Calgary, mais qui a des filiales aux États-Unis. Ils ont profité de cet échappatoire pour pouvoir poursuivre le gouvernement du Canada pour quelque chose, si je ne me trompe pas, à l'ordre de 230 millions de dollars en dédommagement. Avec les dispositions investisseurs-État, une entreprise européenne pourrait entamer les mêmes poursuites. Alors, malgré que je suis d'accord avec mon collègue pour dire que je suis convaincu de la bonne foi euh, des pays européens en ce qui concerne leurs relations avec nous, malheureusement, je suis un peu moins par rapport aux entreprises. Alors, mon collègue n'est-il pas inquiet de ce genre de disposition-là et le fait que ça met à risque le gouvernement du Canada et d'autres instances de gouvernement locaux? The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Well, Madam Speaker, I uh, thank this member for his question as well, and um, I, I am uh, I'm not entirely familiar with the, the details of the case that he makes specific reference to under NAFTA, but it, again, in the broadest terms, I think that we can't lose the opportunity to, to ratify this agreement. Um, I think that we, if we want to uh, look and seek reasons why we should not do an agreement because in an agreement of this size, that there is a, a portion of it that, uh, that is unacceptable, you can talk yourself out of just about any agreement. I think that, in, in, that we need to seize the opportunity that we have before us, take advantage of the work that has happened, and uh, get this agreement approved. <laughs> 